Methodology. Um, I might, I think that you might hate me at the end of the day, but so I'll take it. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to uh, just a session outline. We're starting off with some administration issues as always. I don't know if it's any from my side. So if you have a question or something from your side, think about it now. Then I'll um, show you the groups that you have been divided into. So yeah, all excitement to get in the groups today. Um, and then we'll talk about the topics as well. Okay? Um, and then we'll start with the ethical issues in research. So that's why I say that you might be hating me at the end of um, Okay. Any issues or concerns from your guys' uh, side in terms of administrative issues, technology issues? I saw that there were a lot of assignments that thank you on uh, Google Docs for climate change and disaster management yesterday. So I guess that people sorted out some of the issues regarding that. You had a question? You still can't enter Google Docs. Okay. Um, maybe just send an email to Google and to myself. Which is just email. That's fine. Um, I cannot figure out how to get into my email. See, I can use my email for various different reasons, but is there Mm -hmm. yeah, it's actually it's actually is. Uh, yes, you go to um mail.gmail.com. Is it is it the law or do Yes. Oh, okay. So you go in there and it asks you to sign up uh, sign in and then you just enter the link. I figured that for some reason I can sign in with the email one. Yeah, but the actually it's one is a gmail for us. Any other questions? I'm realizing how little I really know about the technology and stuff. Okay. Um, then these are the groups. So, um, Ms. Isaacs, uh, Ms. Tsepe, Mr. Vivier, so Vivier. Vivier. Um, and Mr. Matipi, you guys are uh, group number one. Then, um, Mr. Ubusen, um, Motibedi, and Duplessy and uh, 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 <laughs> you guys are group number two. Then group number three, three is Ms. Van der Marbe, uh, Mr. Murik Khotla, um, Ms. Pretorius and Ms. Mrs. Mapore. You guys are group number three? Yes. Really? Okay. Um, I'll just... Would be registered, maybe that's a bit too much. Okay. So she, uh, she's not in that group. We'll see if we can make plans to make maybe another. But I really just work with people who make that same. Then um, Ms. Kuman, Mr. Kapore, Mr. Saunders, and Ms. Taba. You guys are group number four. Um, group number five is Mr. An. Uh, An Ananhu, <laughs> um, Botma, Teku, Safe, you guys are group number five. Um, Mutengu, Adebe, Fuyun, uh, Ndabisita. How do you pronounce that? Ndabisita. Okay, you guys are group number six. Um, group number seven is Ms. Sembe, Ms. Leshope, Mr. Kumalu, Mr. Mutengu. You guys are group number seven. And then group number eight is um, Ms. Kunene, Ms. Kakeanu, um, Ms. Mukuna, and Ms. Khaus. Okay, you guys are group number eight. Um, so, I want to say something about this. Oh, there was a very, 
uh, uh, CLR actually divided the groups in uh, the people in two different groups, very scientific method of doing so, <laughs> I, I must say. So, um, this ensures that there's different disciplines within your groups. I see you from, yes. Oh, you're not there! <laughs> Why are you not there? <laughs> now is that I will put up this table, we're including the people that are not on here. Um, I will put this table on Google Docs. So by Wednesday next week, uh, you guys should already have picked the topic. Okay? Um, I'll go through the topics now so you can just, uh, so you can just see them again. Um, also, importantly, start looking at the literature now, already. Um, yeah, I'm just going to start with the research process next week. Um, and from there, you're going to have to be applying all of the things that you are busy with on this, on this side. So make sure that you already start doing research. And um, we are considering, um, to some extent, making some reading available, but don't count on that for now. Start looking at the things already from, uh, from your side and source some resources. And I couldn't believe it. I was so impressed with the scientific method of picking all of the groups and everything, and now there's people missing. <laughs> so that's why the bummer. Okay, um, so the research topics, uh, remember the main focus will be how, to, um, uh, how does different activities or organizations contribute to disaster risk reduction. So we're working with that in all of the studies. Um, then the first study, uh, as I told you before, role of small-scale irrigation systems in increasing household food security. That's the first one. Um, remember we said that we are doing research in Mozambique, Madagascar and Malawi. So all of the first five studies will look specifically at, or will look at the combined data at all three countries. Okay? Um, then the second one, role of farmers associations in contributing to disaster risk reduction. Second topic. Uh, the third one, role of appropriate crop uh, varieties to reduce crop exposure. So that's the third one. Um, promotion of good cropping techniques to mitigate the impact of natural hazards. Um, and then the fourth one, timing of production in hazard prone areas to prevent losses at peak risk periods. Okay? So um, those are the first five. Then um, the next three um, are the different ones, just with a focus on a specific country. Um, so, we're allowing you guys to pick these topics and then also the country that you would like to focus on. However, I'm just telling um, Leandri with some of the topics, some of the countries are more difficult. For example, for the association one, um, <coughs> Mozambique has very little information on the, the farmers association specifically in that country. So, you know, if you, you might pick a topic now, but if you want to pick and maybe just get in touch with some of the, the researchers just to find out. Um, I don't want to say how easy it is because not, none of them are really easy. Um, but yeah, just to see it in terms of the information because you are going to have to source information about that country specifically to describe the situation. And find out that. 
So these are the garments that you can choose from. Um, yeah, like I say, uh, first come, first serve. So as soon as I'll let you know when the um, when the document uh, is on Google Docs, so then you can quickly go shoot for a topic. Okay. Um, agree. One person in a group does it. So there's not four people that chooses four different topics for one group, for example. <laughs> so there's a bit of communicating also involved in this process. Um, okay, so let's quickly start with today's um, session. And we are going to be looking at the ethics in research. Now, I divided it into three different uh, areas. First of all, um, we're looking at ethics within social sciences. Um, and a lot of the Northwest University um, guidelines that we're also going to look at, um, as well as you as a researcher, what you should be looking at, um, comes from, from those guidelines as well. Okay. Um, and they echo one another in terms of mentioning different things. So, the Fawcett al. Um, says that research should be based on mutual trust, acceptance and cooperation, and also an acceptance of the method used um, and the um, acceptance within all of the parties that are involved in this process. Um, human beings as objects of social science bring, bring about a unique set of research, uh, of ethical issues when you're doing research, um, that are not necessarily found in the clinical um, laboratory setting of uh, natural sciences, for example. However, and natural sciences also do have their own set of ethical uh, considerations when doing research in that um, area as well. So uh, then he states this uh, kind of as a general rule that researchers should abide by is that research should never be done at the expense of persons involved. Okay? We'll talk now a bit more about physical harm and emotional harm and that type of thing. Um, there are actually people that say that um, the process of research, if, it, the pro if the process of research does not create an uncomfortable setting for the respondents, um, it, it doesn't really go in depth into the, into the theme or the topic. This is a bit um, contentious. You know, you always have to keep this, this rule in mind when you are doing research and when you're working with research shouldn't have a life-altering effect on someone after the sessions or after your interviews or whatever. Now researchers have two basic uh, categories uh, uh, of responsibility within ethics and research. The one is they have a responsibility to the human and non-human uh, participants in the project. So uh, keeping them in mind, keeping their welfare in mind, uh, the researcher has the responsibility um, and then the second one is the responsibility uh, to the discipline of science to report research accurately and honestly. So not to fabricate stuff within the, um, the, so, uh, the science, social science community and in that body of knowledge. Now examples of unethical um, research behavior or behavior in research uh, is that of faking interview data. It happens. Um, People are rushed for time, deadlines approach, they don't have the quite quota of, of interviews or something that they need to have, and then they just go, oh well, you know, copy this one to this. So it happens. Inaccurate reporting of results. <coughs> also the, um, the ability of the researcher, researcher to actually report the results and report it honestly and openly and, and um, as close to the opinions of the people that you dealt with in that research as possible. Always have to keep um, it as close um, as close as you can. It's difficult because uh, you are the filter that this research goes through, so you have your own concepts and your, uh, I mean, your own context and experiences and things like that that also are included in this process. But we have to try and stay as close to the to what we found from the people in the research as possible. Then, um, also, uh, uh, unethical behavior is great bias in reporting results to prove the researcher's hypothesis, okay? So, sometimes what happens is uh, researchers may use 
the vehicle of research to actually push, push their opinion. So, in that sense, um, that's that's something to keep your eyes on in the research. It's not giving um, the true um, image of what you actually dealt with in your research. You know, people leave stuff out, maybe skip a few questions that prove the different side, etc., etc. Um, then research is done and presented without participant informed consent. We'll talk about this now. Um, it's, it, that's also kind of a, it seems quite straightforward, but it's not. So we'll discuss that as well. And then paid research to address certain issues. Now what sometimes happens are you have research uh, entities or research groups um, like ourselves that do projects uh, for institutions and they cover the research costs. What sometimes happens is that a company gets a research group and they pay for this research, but they, they push their own idea of what should be found. This could be in, uh, you know, we found a lot of conspiracies in terms of car safety with the testing that goes into cars, maybe uh, products, um, uh, medical products and those type of things that also gets tested. Maybe to have an economical benefit in that way. So that, that also happens, and that's considered as greatly um, unethical research in that way. So ethics is conforming to a code of principles, rules of conduct. It's the responsibility of the researcher within um, these two basic responsibility categories that I've mentioned, and it's standards of conduct for a specific profession. So it's predetermined rules that researchers abide by to make sure that there's um, no harm imposed in the subjects that they have within the projects and also that they um, handle the information accurately and in the right way and ethically. So the, uh, specific ethical issues that, that are mentioned in the literature is that of uh, avoidance of harm or causing harm. So this is a difficult one. Um, researchers have an e ethical obligation to protect participants with, uh, in all possible reasonable... Uh, my tongue is not coming to the class today. Okay. Um, it's within reasonable limits uh, for any form of physical harm that might occur within the sessions. Now, within reasonable, reasonable limits, um, you cannot guarantee... I mean, it might be in a situation where you're doing a focus group interview and there's all of a sudden a violent protest. Um, so within reasonable limits, it refers to that that you can actually control. In other words, you actually do this research with, um, and consider uh, the participants that take part in it and their well-being when doing this research. So keeping that in mind entirely when you're doing it. Now, emotional harm is a bit more difficult. Um, in avoiding, how? Why would you say that is the case? I could say yes. Okay, fine. I'll try and get focus group to meet in a safe location. Um, I'll try and avoid um, violent outbreaks within the situation of doing the research. Why is emotional such a difficult thing to emotional harm such a difficult thing to avoid? Sorry, yeah? It tends to be personal, yes. It has a personal context. So, you as a researcher, you guys are sitting here, I have no idea what your experience has been prior to this moment. So, I might raise certain issues that are very emotional uh, emotional issues to you. Um, issues like, you know, um, we find this a lot in terms of health issues, people being interviewed on that. People being interviewed on crime, Prime um, aspects, those are the things, things that are emotionally um, quite heavy for some people. So that makes it a bit more difficult. That does not say that you should not attempt to avoid um, causing emotional harm. Okay, so people's contexts are um, complex and the researcher might not know of the participants' uh, experiences prior to this investigation. Respondents should be thoroughly informed beforehand about the project and its impact that, um, so that they can choose. Now this is this is an important part, and this is where informed consent also comes um, comes in, and we'll talk about this more um, as well. But people need to know what they're reading themselves in the book, um, and then also, um, so 
they can judge whether they will be fine with the content or not. The things that we deal with sometimes, um, I haven't uh, to such an extent handled such um, heavy emotional content with regard to research. We look at, at uh, live views and different other things, but there might be some aspects of that that people feel emotional about. So we always say to them, they let them know what's going to be asked, how it's going to be asked, what's going to happen with the um, I think on this, we had an experience with the foul fires that we did the research for um, in 2000. And um, we brought together a multidisciplinary group, and one of that group members was uh, from psychology. So, you know, we were very excited in the sense that someone actually looking at this component of this also impacting and vulnerability and that kind of thing. However, he had such a difficult time in that research project because he was speaking to farmers about their about the impact they have experienced from this fire. And he said that you have to consider so many things when you're actually approaching these people. It's such a dramatic experience. There's a lot of shock still there. And there's a lot of emotion running through these guys. And I mean, it's former, so it's even more complex and more difficult to, to actually get them to, to speak about these things. So fortunately, in that regard, this guy, the, the psych psychologist that actually did the research, he was very, very um, set on ethical behavior and how to do this and so on. And in a few, few sessions, it happened that there was an outburst of emotion. But he was capable of handling that because he had the training. So in that sense, you know, we sometimes get ourselves into this these situations because as researchers, we see the interesting aspects of research in terms of broadening the knowledge base, things that does not exist on a certain topic. But we have to remember that it's not only um, about the research, it, it's about the people in the research as well. And take their well being into account. And know that we are capable of handling what we are going to do. Okay, luckily, good. So that, that was good. Um, Okay, so all research activities should be guided by the ethical rule of the researcher, researcher must bring no harm to the participant. So this is the guideline all researchers should work from uh, when they are considering their, um, their research. Um, it, sometimes people tend to, to get oversensitive about, about this, um, but in that case it's, it's best to maybe check it with a small group of the participants in the sense of, you know, okay, we're trying to discuss these things, what do you think about it? Uh, do you think people actually are sensitive to this? So then the second one um, that's quite important is that of volunt voluntary participation. So, excuse me, particip participation should be voluntary at all times and people need to know they can withdraw their involvement at any time. This, to a certain extent, if you are uh, setting up a research project and working with a bunch of participants, it's kind of meant to mirror something. You know, if you have to talk to a specific number of people, um, it, it would be bad, or it, it, you would be in a quite a situation when you're dropped for, you know, some people deciding to not, not work back. However, this is something that's not at all, um, that, that cannot be compromised at all. You have to at all time let the participants know that if they are uncomfortable, if they feel they do not have time, if they feel that they need to go, they can go. They are um, they're partaking voluntarily. Then um, it's more difficult in terms of participant observation research. All of the things that we spoke about now, um, the the question of harm in terms of information that you and avoiding that by giving information, it's a bit difficult in um, in um, participant observation methods that are used. That influences if you were to, for example, join a club or join a certain social situation to actually research that social situation. On the one hand, it's unethical if you do the research and take the information without informing people that you are actually researching them. I mean, I put myself in a situation. I wouldn't be too happy if someone is researching me and I'm not aware of it. But in the, in the other sense, if you know that someone's researching you, you're going to be at different 
So you're going to maybe ultimately, to some extent, think that influence is now the, the research of the as well. So it's a difficult balance. There's not many answers in terms of this. Some people say that afterwards, after you've done the research, you might actually inform people and, and engage them in terms of what you were busy with. Um, it's a difficult balance that you need to keep. So, informed consent. Now, informed consent implies uh, that all possible and um, adequate information is given to participants about, firstly, the goal of the investigation, so your research questions, what do you want to achieve with this, where is this going, um, it, the expected duration of the participants involved. Is this a 10 minute questionnaire, or are you going to have a 10 minute questionnaire, and then a week from now you have to find this person back, and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So, make people aware of how they're going to be involved in this and what, to what extent the time duration will be. Then procedures that will be followed during the investigation. We'll talk a bit about the procedures as well, but <clears throat> how is this going to be done? Some people are very unfamiliar with research procedures. So, um, <clears throat> before um, I came to study, the only thing one knows about research is maybe a questionnaire that someone puts in hand. Or three questions that someone has always stopped you and says, listen, I really just want to know your opinion about blah, blah, blah. But <clears throat> it's much more than that, and, and people might not know that. So you have to inform them about the um, processes and procedures. Also, the disadvantages or dangers that participants might be exposed to. So that no, causing no harm rule applying here, saying that, okay, well, I'm open, and, um, I'm open and honest with you. This is the things that we are going to discuss. So, for instance, if you have, have an experience in terms of this, that, and the other, it might not be quite a positive experience um, being involved in this research. <coughs> and then also the credibility of the research. So, participants should be able to make a voluntar voluntary, thoroughly reasoned decision. Could be adopted this way. So they have to have all of the information and they must be able to make that, that decision for themselves. Okay, <clears throat> then participants must be legally and psychologically competent to consent. So this is important when you're working, when you're looking at a research topic that deals with children, that becomes ethically, um, that, that becomes an ethical issue. If you're working with um, uh, very poor people in that sense, um, it's, you have to look at various ethical issues that, that you um, engage with them on before you can do your research. So, <coughs> um, uh, yes. Can I ask a question? You can. Uh, just a question. You want to interview uh, some age let's say kids, babies, and you want to research on the type of food they eat. I don't, I don't know how you should be able to get the right information from this case because they are not being fed. Like, let's say, you tell you their yeah, parents, their mothers. Yeah. I don't know how you would get the right information about, let's say, the type of baby food. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Yes, how you feel about eating that food. Yeah. I don't know how you would get that information from um, parents. From parents. It's difficult. The younger the kids are, the more ethical issues there are involved. So, <coughs> Um, we don't deal necessarily with uh, very small children in our research, so I haven't been through the process where we have to get approval in terms of that. However, we have done a, <coughs> a project where we work with, um, with school girls between the ages of grade 8 and uh, grade 10. So, how old are you when you go to grade 8? So, it's 14. So, between 14 and 16. Um, and and in that project, we actually have to get specific um, uh, consent um, and apply from parents or guardians. Um, either them sitting in on the research, actually interviewing them with their parents, which would be the, the um, preferred setting, or actually getting from, uh, informed consent from them. So informing them what the research is about, actually showing them the information. I mean, but there's, there's always this, it's up to the person. Because there's always this chance that you might decide, well, I actually want to see if I'm going to get the question. So there's always this, you as a person have to decide if you're going to be there the In that sense, I'm not sure. Um, 
you how you got that? Um, I think the parents would know because you know kids when you think if the child has money that's like it obviously it's really hard to shift the child exit to show solo yeah. and you know sometimes as a parent you see okay this was like this now yeah. Yeah. I think so it's possible for them to be there. But but also um in the sense what if you're looking at let's say for instance the perception of who the mom's youngest in the ages of five and six something like that, when you're doing etc. and that, then they could actually have quite interesting research in terms of how they perceive the things that they're doing, what do they attach to a, psycho a psychological research in terms of what experience do they attach to it, and those other things like perhaps in that Yes. Yeah, the reason why I'm asking this question is, uh, I thought it was by the time, there were also a sort of really few in that most of the way we start. Yeah. So if you want to research, well, well, in that case, you need to go to the parents to get, I mean, if it's baby food of a young age, you know, it would be difficult to get accurate information because the conceptual world is not. But I think that the research will be more. Yes. 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 of formula that they have, um, that they give them to um, African communities and then babies start to die in the formula. So, you know, in that regard, um, there is a big component of research that is not done in terms of looking at the context of the people that are actually doing this formula. Um, interestingly, it was the water quality that I People were not were not told that they should um, uh, boil the water, so they they used it in that. Okay, um, but people they Nestle should have done this. <coughs> um, okay. Um, also, hidden agendas in research. Oh wow, this is one of those um, things that you come across quite regularly when you do this. Um, informed consent ensures that people are aware and know. Uh, what should be their expectation from this research? Um, so they know now, you know, are you actually giving them something afterwards? If you do, um, what's going to happen after this research? They are giving all of this information to you, and what, what's going to happen to their situation? Is it going to be better off? What, what's going to happen? And I, when I did my research for my masters, we, I, I looked at a relationship um, between the community and the fire station in Africa. Um, they cover quite a large area. I cannot tell you how many um, discussions I had um, in a particular area about political issues, such as delivery regarding housing, uh, electricity, those types of things. It wasn't part of the thing that I was looking at, but people expected that there's someone to listen, I'm going to raise my voice because this person's going to get these issues out there. So after that session, I kind of had to sit down with everybody and say, OK, no, let's, let's really um, reset this. Let me just tell you this. And then I can kind of explain it, that I'm only looking at, at these things. And even with regard to the fire station and your relationship, I might not even be able to make a difference in that people. Um, but we are discussing this information and all that. Okay, so people have to know what they, what they can expect from the situation. Otherwise, um, you know, it might turn into something very different. So be aware of the hidden agendas um, and that people might expect that they're getting something from this research, but they might not. Then deception of subjects. Like I said, sometimes time limits uh, or deadlines creep up on you. People need to get in research. Now you have a person in front of you, perfect candidate for this research, perfect respondent. 
but they don't want to participate. So you decide, well, maybe you just, you're not telling them that the research will be used for this thing specifically, or you're not telling them the entire truth with regard to who actually asked for the research, etc., etc. Um, that's considered totally unethical in research. Um, to withhold information or to not tell the truth to participants. Um, participants should never be deceived in participating in research. Uh, researchers should be open and honest about the entire project and indicate that. Like I said, it's, it's more difficult when you do participant observation research, um, but in general the rule is to never deceive participants. And even in participant um, observation, uh, observation research, the deception is not acceptable. Okay, so then the other thing is violation of privacy, anonymity, and confidentiality. We start with concepts and how they are handled within research. Privacy and uh, confidentiality in research can be violated in different ways, and it might be violated in such a way that you don't necessarily know that you are violated. Uh, participants should be informed about the limitations of a project, um, their privacy and confidentiality, and how the process will follow. Um, and how you are going to use that information. So be open with people say, you know, who are going to be the people that have access to this information, how are you going to use the answers that a specific individual actually give you in your research and in your report. Um, <clears throat> the use of hidden video cameras and recording devices also seen as unethical. Be open and honest with the people say that, you know, um, I want to uh, do a voice recording of this interview, do you mind? I'm only going to use, you know, explain your intention with it. I'm only going to use it for your research um, report and to refer back to and so on and so on. Um, because it's also an important part. It's also an important part in staying true to the subjects and their opinions and the research. So it, it can help you a lot. So, but, but just be open about that. Um, anonymity and confidentiality are two different things, and, and um, anonymity is um, harder to guarantee in a sense. Um, <clears throat> researchers, researchers sometimes have to know the contents of the people that they are interviewing, and to actually gain, because you are, at, you are the person analyzing this research, to, to understand with what perception and what background this person is functioning. Now, anonymity means that uh, no one, not even the researcher, should be able to identify the person after the research. Um, and then confidentiality, uh, in comparison to that, is where the researcher and maybe the research team that works with the interviews and things, they know who the person are, but they protect the identity of the person and not make it available to people outside of the research project. So. Now, we had an interesting situation. Um, when we were doing a, a big national research project at one stage. Um, we had an interview with the manager, a manager of the specific department, but he um, didn't, um, he, he was busy or whatever, and he couldn't come, so he sent someone out. Um, they said he came to the interview and we started discussing things, and, um, and we went through all of the, uh, you know, what the research is going to be used for, etc., etc. And then she gets on now, but she's, she doesn't think she's the person to speak to. So now, oh, okay, if you feel that way, here, here are the questions. You can just read through them if you want to know what it's And then she said, okay, now, well, she had that one. And we started with your man position, please. And she said, mm -hmm. not going to tell you. And we, we both were kind of taken aback because we. To some extent, understand that people want to stay anonymous. So we want to respect that. But on the other side, there's this, we, we don't have the advantage point to actually analyze this, this perception problem. So we started, we said, okay, well, fine, you know, we, we won't um, make your identity known at all. We won't even know it. Um, and then we went through the interview, and this lady had such insight into the, into the topic. Um, and from the interview, I kind of, uh, got the idea that she, she was actually working with um, the specific units in the research project that we, we wanted information from. All of the other people were working on a higher national level, but she was actually in contact with these um, with this units. So at the end of this, the interview, um, we 
So that happens as well. Um, so make sure that, that when you uh, involve this protection of, of identity and things like that in the research that you do, um, that you indicate to the participants as well. To some extent, we kind of need to know the context of your situation by knowing your position or your, um, or your uh, um, profession or whatever. whatever. <coughs> okay, then compensation. Now, this is also a bit of a contentious aspect. Participants might be reimbursed for costs that they have to participate in the research. So traveling costs to actually get to the group interviews or things like that, um, can, they can be reimbursed for because it's just fair. <coughs> but compensation in terms of actually paying someone to partake in research is not, it's not necessarily seen as, as correct practice. Um, and, and especially if this becomes the main reason for people actually participating in research, to be paid, yes. Where they go, you know, over weeks or over years or whatever, they tend to compensate for, um, participants do that because their involvement is um, so, so extensive. <coughs> um, and also, when, when payment for this research becomes the main reason people are actually taking part, if you were to say, well, even though I don't set the research criteria for a respondent for this research, I'm going to do it. Um, in any case, I'm going to maybe conceal some of the information that, that um, excludes me from this group um, to get the payment. Then, then it becomes an ethical issue because now the study's um, content is actually um, influenced by that. Um, <coughs> some people uh, work a lot with food. <coughs> Sorry. Some people work a lot with food parcels if they're. Um, doing research within a very rural area um, or in a very poor area. Um, it should, it, the, the golden rule is that it should not become the main reason for people participating. Same with um, lunches and coffees and teas. Um, what we usually do is we never, we never indicate that that's what's going to be at the venue or at the, um, the interviews or whatever. We just make it available. So people don't come there with the expectation that they're going to receive it. Same with the food courses, I'd say. Um, so that should never be the reason that people participate. Okay, let's quickly look at the uh, Northwest, um, the university's ethical requirements. Um, so the, the university have a research ethics committee. 
Um, and these guys uh, have implemented the checklist for students and faculties to evaluate research proposals that come in and that are developed. Um, I'll, I'll show you just a quick example of how this looks. Um, so, the process, what does the process involve and what does this research ethics committee actually do? They are responsible for the formulation and ethics guidelines for the Northwest University. Um, and they're also responsible for e evaluating and approving research protocols. And then furthermore, they monitor the process of the things that they approve. So every, every um, project that they approve, ethically, excuse me, um, they monitor then afterwards. Then all research involving people must be approved by this committee before the study can begin. Um, and super, supervisors um, of postgrad uh, students apply for this research um, approval at the committee, or the ethical approval. So for most masters and PhD programs, what they do is they actually pre-approve um, an ethic, ethical protocol for that program. Um, and, then, <coughs> and then students are allocated to projects that already fall within the scope of this um, ethical agreement with, within the program. So, and I'll show you the checklist now. What happens is you start your research and then you go through this checklist um, and if you indicate uh, no on some of the questions, then you have to go through the ethical committee process outside of this agreement. Okay, so then it falls without, um, outside the scope of the agreement already made. Um, if you gain approval, the approval is valid for five years, and each year you have to submit a progress report in terms of how this research, research is progressing. Um, the requirements, I went through some of it, um, it's very practical in terms of the guidelines that they give and the things you have to hand into them. Of course, you have to hand in all of your questions that you're going to ask, what your starting date will be, what your ending date will be. All of those type of things, who are you looking to interview, etc., etc., etc. But then, <clears throat> something that they also make mention of that we saw in terms of the um, ethical guidelines within social sciences is that of voluntary consent and informed, um, informed consent. So they make mention of that you have to actually um, add a document f uh, with such an example. So this is how the form looks like. You can see they ask questions like, for example, does the study involve participants who are particularly vulnerable or unable to give informed consent? Or you take yes or no. <clears throat> Will it be necessary for participants to take part in the study without their knowledge and consent at that time? So you go through all of these ethical questions, and if you if you note one question no, then you have to go through this entire um, process outside of the program. Um, then also, the end looks like this. We're going to end quite early today, I think. Okay. Now, plagiarism. Um, I thought about, I think some of you guys will be wondering why we are discussing that. Because you have already studied and you have already written a lot of things and you have been involved in research. Now, some of you might, have, might not have been studying or involved in research before you came to do this um, for quite some time. But this is, this is something that we see more often than we should. The assignments that we work in the master's programs that we do. Um, and it's a, it's a very easy thing to catch as well. So people that do plagiarism or that apply, they think, no, well, they're going to um, mislead the person that's going through this or evaluating it quite, quite easily, and it's not. Very easy to pick up plagiarism. Now, what does the Northwest University see <coughs> plagiarism as? Um, they say plagiarism is a malpractice. Um, it's an unlawful claiming and presenting of someone's, someone else's idea or expression of those ideas in your words. <coughs> um, they say that plagiarism is, or they see plagiarism as academic fraud, which is quite serious. The consequences of actually doing plagiarism or being guilty of plagiarism is that if you are, this comes out of the, um, either the, resource, uh, the reference booklet or the guideline for postgraduate students. <coughs> if a student is found guilty of plagiarism when submitting a thesis or report, 
it could be a case of um, contravening um, the university's code of contact, conduct, which in turn could lead to a disciplinary action, and then um, the university could also reject the piece of work that you actually um, are guilty of plagiarizing, so you can see the um, north and then fail as well. Um, and it could lead to um, legal action as well, depending on how extensive the plagiarism is. Now, it's something that, that people could actually do intentionally or unintentionally without knowing. So, um, make sure that you go through all of the guidelines in terms of this to make sure that you don't make yourself guilty of this without um, <clears throat> So, uh, when is it plagiarism? When you write a sentence in your own um, report or academic writing without a reference or quoting um, it correctly, uh, it, Im it implies I as the examiner or as the lecturer or as the supervisor, I read it as this is your own words. Okay? Um, if this is not the case, it's, it's plagiarism. Um, and it's, it's so difficult because plagiarism is one of those things that you might, have been, you might do it unintentionally, um, but it kind of hurts the trust between the person that's evaluating you and yourself. In the sense that you will always be suspected when doing it. So if you if you if someone has caught you once in terms of copy and pasting or applying or, or being guilty of plagiarism, that your second case in why are you smiling? <laughs> okay. So you know what, what happens, and you know how serious it could be. Um, so in terms of that, the, the trust is kind of broken, and I'm not that I'm not getting mentioned in this regard, you know, um, trust and trusting, but it's bad for you, because you will always be checked out on. You see, if it's happened, if you have copy and pasted, are you using your reference? So you, you'll be mocked very critical, critically in terms of the technical aspect. Um, <clears throat> then, also, when you copy and paste text without the co uh, correct recognition of the author, that's plagiarism. When you copy a lecturer's notes, plagiarism. <laughs> and you think people would think that they will not use lecturer's notes because they are handing in an assignment to the same lecturer? They don't. They do. They still do it. There is. <laughs> There are situations in the past as well. It's, it's kind of um, <clears throat> then copying internet content. It's as easy as making a Google search. Um, when when you mark something, when you go to it, and you read it, <coughs> sorry, you as a writer have a have a specific writing style and a specific um, argumentation style and so it's immediately obvious if you copy and paste something from somewhere into your argument because that just looks like that. You might think it, it, it flows into each other and it, it uh, corresponds, it doesn't. You, you see it right now. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. So, um, copying internet sources, plagiarism. Or any other content that you did not write yourself and you are presenting it without any reference to where you got it from. That's plagiarism. Um, it's also regarded as unethical use. I don't know if it's necessarily plagiarism per se, but it's also frowned upon to uh, write the exact words from a source, put it in quotations, and then reference it. The idea with writing and with um, research is not to uh, just uh, indicate or just that. Uh, ideas and argument, arguments from different sources and just presenting them. The idea with writing and research, like we talked about in the previous class about knowledge and how it's developed and how it comes to be, <coughs> it's about developing something from your perspective and from your environment. So just copying and pasting it in the, putting in protections and putting in the reference does not tell me anything about what you're thinking about the specific subject. So remember that. That's that's the main idea. <coughs> Sorry. Yes. <coughs> you can quote. They say it very nicely in the in the referencing guidebook. And guide. Um, they talk about 
only use quotations when uh, when no other wording of that specific idea would suffice. So if that's the only, it's the most powerful um, presentation of that idea, you can use it. But the thing is, keep that in mind. It shouldn't, it shouldn't form the, the main part of your, of your piece of work. Um, because then where are you? You're not here just giving yourself. I, I want to see you argue, um, argue about this thing um, and integrate yourself actually sensible arguments from the okay. So, is not wrong. You can use them, you can very limited, um, to a limited extent. Um, and when you use them, try and incorporate them into your organization as well. Okay, does that make sense? No. So, <coughs> how to avoid plagiarism? Main thing is referencing. Um, we always say, we deal with a lot of practitioners um, when we short courses, um, but they're not necessarily in an academic environment each day and every day. We sometimes say, well, just we need to find the source of your problems from. That's all. You just have to acknowledge it in some way. But references is the main the main um, way of avoiding plagiarism. Um, and like I said, not not just refer referencing a quotation of the exact wording, but you know, um, referencing the ideas. So, text references use text re references within your work, and also accurate bibliographies um, and uh, bibli yeah, bibliographies. Um, so the style that we currently use is the Harvard style. Um, you can find the way in referencing and how to reference and when to reference what and everything you can find in the um, Northwest University Source Referencing Guide. That is available on your free for you guys. Um, we loaded up there as one of the resources. Uh, one of the girls yesterday said that, um, complained that she went to buy it at some bookstore and there was only Afrikaans copies of this booklet. You have an English one on your free that you can use. Okay, but use it. If you wonder about how to reference something, refer to that booklet and reference it accordingly. Um, okay, so the purpose of references is firstly, um, it's a, it's, you all have probably done a lot of referencing in your studying. Um, it's not one of the most common processes, right? It's, it, in Afrikaans you say it's what? It's not, I hate it. Um, it takes so much time and you have to be, they're so pedantic about the comments and the full stops and the what, spaces and yeah, the spaces and everything of, um, like that. Um, but there are certain reasons why we use this within the writing. Um, it gives recognition to the original uh, author, so that's the most important thing. We want to see where your ideas came from. You pro provide proof of the source of your information. Um, also, Importantly, using accepted sources in general lends authority to your work. So now you hand in something that's written without any sources. Um, I kind of think, well, did you have a dream and came up with this type of thing? Remember we were talking um, in the previous session about how knowledge is created and you have to relate that to the environment around you. Uh, this is part of the process. We can see that in mind. Um, then also, readers use re uh, references to find additional information on the subject. I want to know who has used the reference to, to um, do further reading on something and it was an incorrect reference. I struggled with that. You were, reading, <coughs> you were reading something and saw a reference that they made to a different author, so you actually went to look for that source, but it was wrong, so you didn't find it. Nobody. Lucky. In that sense, um, I, it has happened to me quite sometimes, um, where an uh, author of a specific paper or something references another author, um, and I think, hey, but I, you know, I want to read up further on this subject or whatever, so I want to go look at them, search the author and search the paper and things, and it's wrong. You don't find it, or the pa page number is wrong or something like that. So you don't find that quite frustrating if you're if you're doing research for a specific specific thing um, and then also in this module um, and I think 
uh, in the other modules as well, I'm not entirely sure, but for this module, let me speak for me research methodology. Um, we are going to uh, let you submit all of your assessments on, or formal assessments on your tool. So, what this helps with is there's a very nice program called Turnitin that it runs your document through. Um, there are some features in terms of that, so, you know, you will know uh, to what extent your, your work compares to wording of other work. Um, but also, it's a, it's a good way to make sure that you, um, that you write your own things. Okay, now, things that are not necessarily um, considered as plagiarism per se, but also ethical issues within research and uh, for the researcher specifically. Um, is that is the inaccurate use of, of sources. So, always try to find a primary source. Um, it's not a taboo to use secondary sources. And what is secondary sources? Secondary sources is, like for example, the example I put there, where the faucet all puts a statement of a model of evaluation, blah, 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 by blue metal. Okay, that's it. Blue metal is now the secondary source. Now you go and you're doing research and you want to use that statement. So instead of saying blue metal it all as cited in the course, see if you can find blue metal. So they make provision in the sense that if you cannot at all by any means find the um, original source, it is okay to reference this, um, the secondary source. But make sure that your secondary sources are kept to a, limit, um, to a minimum. Okay. Um, the main idea about this is that it, it looks to the examiner um, or to the person evaluating you that you only took one book, read all of the things that were written in that one book, and you just make use of the references that they have to um, And that's not the idea that we want to that we want to do here. Um, also, you might use the you might use that statement the faucet all night from blue, um, but he might have referenced it incorrectly, or uh, he might have misinterpreted that argument. And now you, without consulting the original source, you are just taking that argument in and um, using it for your own, um, and that makes your work weaker and, and um, also misinterpreted as well. Okay, so, so check up on that. Um, then the overuse of sources, the golden rule that we usually say is if you're um, using a source more than twice consecutively, you're overusing that source. So sometimes it's difficult because you have a specific person that um, focuses on the topic or um, that is an expert within his field on that specific topic, then it's difficult. But then um, present it as such, so, you know, limited um, literature out there, and um, so this guy was is one of the main thinkers in um, And it's also not acceptable to just um, replace the references that you're overusing with just some other authors. And yes, people think people are stupid enough to not notice. Um, so it's not acceptable to do that. Um, rather go see if you can find it Okay. Um, that's my thing. <laughs> Do you hate me now? Yes. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, there's something you want to add to this. I, I can't think of anything after this. Okay. So, just by, I, I know this was terrible and stuff. Um, <laughs> But it's important for you guys to know these things so you know what we expect from you as well. Okay. Um, next week. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so Leandri will be seeing you guys next week. You're free from this one for now. Um, but obviously you like doing the module. Okay. Good. Then what's the time now? Yeah, you have a few minutes before the next one. Yes? Oh, sorry, okay. We should be quickly put the group back on yes. so you can just 
to indicate to who are the group and... Okay. What are you going to send it as well to the uh, I'm going to try and sort out the six people that are not on the list. And then I'll try and put put the list on, on Google Docs. But what I'll do is I'll send you an email. I want to do it before the end of the week so you have time to choose the topics. Yes. Yes. We, we have... Yeah. This is not the... Um, this is just my cheap way of giving it to your presentation. Um, we have a, a list with initials and um, the student numbers and everything. So you'll have all of the information. Okay. Let's quickly put that on so you can see your groups again. Okay, first group, where are you? Are you here? <laughs> Here we go. So you're missing a member. Who are you missing? Cynthia. Is she here? Zondria. Zondria. Not here. I must say, I don't recall her in the first class as well. Do you guys know her? Okay. Introduce. No, I suck at names. Okay. So, uh, group number two. You're also missing one, but is it? Who? Tip. Oh, duplicity. Okay, sorry. Um, NJ. I didn't know she. Okay, anyway. Um, group number three. Okay. Yeah, so it's not so it's, okay. Um Um okay, then group number four. Only two, where's the other people? Sitskuman. Schumann. Um in what's your center? Okay. So Saunders and Kapara, but Tavis not here. And Tian. Okay. Um, then group number five. Oh my gosh. Nobody. <laughs> not even one. Okay. Um, oh yeah, but Tech is not here today. I guess she should have been here. Um, number six. <laughs> so the names that we have on here is not here, and the ones that we do have here is not on here. Okay. Um, so uh, group number seven. Also one. Okay. And group number eight. Two. Yay! Good. Good job, guys. Good job. Okay, yes, full representation. Okay, so the arrangements in terms of this is that I'll try and sort, you guys must just, the ones that are not on this come see me now, so we can write your details I remember, I'm not that good at remembering things. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll let you know through Fundi when I put it onto Google Docs. Or I think there's actually a notification when you put it on Google Docs. Um, I can put the notification on and you'll receive that via your group wise email. No? Yes. No. ACS email. ACS email. You see? Struggling with the song. Yeah. Uh, initial sense any. And student number. Is that you have to be on the list and you have to be as full time students. You have to be on the list and you have to be on the list. That's it. Issues with these things, no? Issues? Me and Bedlock. 
When is the next test study? 